Are you able to see the attendee count? Mm, no. Okay. All right, I'll tell you when people start rolling in. Okay. I, I can say. Oh yeah, I, I can. Participants. There, there you go. go. Yep. Hello, friends. Amy and I were just talking about our, our coffee habits that Amy drinks no coffee today because she's a saint and I drink <laughs> 9,000 cups of coffee today. It actually hurts my stomach. I used to like it, but I can't drink it anymore. I'll be a blessing. <laughs> it, is, it is. It is. I, I'm a tea drinker now, which I never thought I would be, but. This thing we, we call it the happy hour, and at first I thought, oh, everyone would have an alcoholic beverage, but the time zones and everything so different that yeah. uh, um, I end up just doing, you know, like a San, San Pellegrino water. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, people are rolling. We can get started. I'm going to share my screen. Oh. All right, friends. I hope you can see. Uh, let me know in the chat if you cannot see uh, our beautiful deck created by our graphic designer, Nick. Uh, this is the Crossbeam Happy Hour. Thank you so much for everyone joining. Uh, this is where we provide uh, conference-worthy career advice insights. Uh, you can check out highlights from past Crossbeam Happy Hours on YouTube or by subscribing to our newsletter, which is at crossbeam.com slash subscribe. Uh, joining me today is Amy Gallo live from Rhode Island. Uh, Amy is an expert in conflict, communication, and workplace dynamics. She combines the latest management research with practical advice to deliver evidence-based ideas on how to improve relationships and excel at work. And she's the author of this book, which is right here, uh, The HBR Guide to Dealing with Conflict, a how-to guidebook about handling conflict professionally and productively. Amy, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Sean. Let me drop, let me drop the... Uh, well, I dropped the book in the chat. I wonder if you could give a, just a brief synopsis for the people about what the book is, what's it about, and when it was published, and the reaction you've seen since you've sure. released it. Yeah, so the book came out in 2017, April 2017, and it's part of a series that Harvard Business Review has the HBR Guides to. So there's the HBR Guide to Negotiating or the HBR Guide to Networking. Um, this one is specifically about conflict. It's meant to be a very straightforward, practical, approach to dealing with conflict at work. Although I have lots of lots of readers who've told me I use it to deal with conflict with my neighbors or with my roommates, um, so or family members. Uh, I do think that all of the frameworks and tools that I give are probably applicable across different um, venues and contexts. Um, so really, it is focused on work, but hopefully more more broadly applicable. And it's been I've had just an amazing response to to the book. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's really meant to be very straightforward, practical. It's ideally something you can sit down and read in you know two three hours, um, but then hopefully come back to over and over, find it on your bookshelf like you've got Sean um, to to read you know refamiliarize yourself with with the tools. Um, people have told me that they find it in incredibly helpful. I've been asked to speak all over the world about the topic. It's just been a really, really nice response. You know, I should say it's extremely actionable. So most of the people here um, work in partnerships at, at SaaS companies, and we know uh, dealing with conflict and collaboration with internally and externally, a big part of that job. That's what Amy and I are going to talk a lot, a lot about today. Um, so schedule, uh, I will outline four questions for Amy, uh, some of which were submitted by you guys, the attendees, when you fill out the form uh, to, to join our happy hour. Um, I'll leave some time open for Q&A, which you could drop in the chat, and then Amy and I can see. I'll pick uh, the best ones to surface to Amy, and then we'll get the heck out of here. It's a beautiful day on most of the East Coast. Go outside and get a suntan. Um, before we go, uh, a chat question for you to think about, which is, um, what is your natural tendency when it comes to conflict? So if you drop in the chat, Amy and I can see your results. Um, you're either a voider, a seeker, or a bit of both. Amy, could you briefly describe what an avoider and a seeker is? Of course. So uh, the, yes, of course. So an avoider, and the, this is, um, there are lots of different frameworks to think about um, what your tendency is or style or approaches to conflict. Um, I try to really keep it simple. I found this has resonated with a lot of audiences. 
um, just to think about what's your natural instinct. So when you're under stress, which most of us experience stress when we're dealing with a conflict, what's your go-to? And an avoider is that person who really, when conflicts come up, they want to like sort of slide under the table, they lean back, they're, they're really um, would prefer to just get the conversation over with or not have it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, that's because they value relationships and harmony. Um, and seekers, on the other hand, I'm a seeker, which is probably why I wrote a book about conflict, um, are those people who sort of lean into conflict. They might even create it some. Um, they, you know, really thrive off, um, you know, real uh, tense discussions of heated debates. And that's because they tend to value directness and honesty. Not that they don't care about relationships and harmony, it's just not what they prioritize. It's worth saying most people are, are a bit of both and this is a bit of a spectrum. You, you don't always avoid or always seek, although I do, I do meet people who, who think of themselves that way. You know, you might be an avoider with um, externally with partners, but mm -hmm. a seeker internally with your peers in your organization. Or you might be a seeker with, you know, the people who work on your team, but an avoider with your boss. Um, or an avoider with most people, but a seeker with your mother, for example, right? You can really, um, you can adapt your style accordingly. And, and ideally, you understand what your natural tendency is, and then you can choose the style that works best for that particular situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's safe to say, so some responses coming in, a lot of avoiders. Yeah, not too Two surprising. people who are both, and only one seeker. Shout out to my seekers out there. I think yes. I would cross about myself with that. Yeah. Um, and I think the context for th thinking about this question, which is as Amy and I discuss conflict, the types of conflict, how to manage conflict, knowing the context at which you're bringing to the situation and, and which one of these you prefer in your natural in inclinations can be very helpful. Again, all things covered, not book. Yeah. Um, so we'll start with a uh, question one. Um, mm -hmm. What are the types of conflict? And maybe even before you get into the types, you lay out a nice decision-making framework for the types of conflicts, the possible results, uh, which I stole from your book right here. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to walk uh, our attendees through. Sure. So this, this is based on research that's done by negotiation experts, conflict experts. And these are really the types of conflict. Some people think of, about, of them as the sources of conflict. I think particularly when you think about partnerships, it's helpful to figure out the type of conflict you're having because that will help you decide how to address it, right? Um, first and foremost, most of us, when we experience a conflict, uh, shout out to the avoiders there, we think of it as a relationship conflict. And oftentimes we avoid conflict because we think this is gonna destroy the relationship or damage my career or damage this partnership, right? We think it's something interpersonal, one person disrespecting another. Those conflicts absolutely happen usually most work conflicts start as one of the other three. Um, and that's not to say they don't devolve into the relationship conflicts, but it's rare that's where it, it starts. And oftentimes, if you think you're having a relationship conflict, it's, you think it's something to do with personality, it's worth asking, where did this conflict really start? Um, the most common is actually task. And that's, a, as it says here, disagreement over the goal or... Um, you know, the objective of a task or a project. This is the what, right? We don't agree on what we're actually achieving. I can see this happening a lot in partnerships, right? We've set up this partnership. We've decided how it's all going to work, but perhaps there was a miscommunication or misalignment around the goal, or you come to the partnership with different goals, right? And that can really, I think, set up, um, set up a, a scenario where you're going to have a lot of conflict. Related to that, and another really common type of conflict is process. So maybe we agree on the goal, maybe we've agreed on how what the, the ultimate objective of our partnership is, but we disagree on how that's going to be carried out. So where task is the what, process is the, is the how. And that can be things over timing, um, amount of you know, energy or effort or resources that each part of the partnership puts in. Um, it's really, when you think about what, how do we get from A to B, there's lots of, of types of conflict or sources of conflict in that, in that process. And the last is status. Um, I can see this playing a big role in, 
in partnerships as well, right? Is this is a disagreement over who has the authority to make a decision, who has more power in a particular relationship. And, and this is just a disagreement over who gets credit, who makes the decision. Um, it, it, this is a, a really tricky type of conflict to solve, um, but it is really helpful to resolve it. Um, it's helpful to know that oftentimes with, if you start by solving the task or the process conflict, right? Because many conflicts are in hot mess of all four of these. If you can start with task or process, those tend to be less um, personalized. They, they seem to be less associated with people's identities or egos. And if you can solve those, oftentimes it can help surface or solve the other types, relationship and status. So I generally advise people to start with, with task or process before trying to, to tackle relationship or status. A point you make in the book, which I've thought about since, is the idea of depersonalizing a conflict and the importance of that. And I was wondering if you could share that and you know, how it relates to these four types of conflict. Yeah. So, I mean, depersonalizing is an incredibly helpful um, process for two reasons. One, if you can remove your own ego and sense of identity from a conflict, you're going to see it much more clearly. You're going to approach it more, um, you know, calm, collected, right? If you're not sort of attached to the outcome, but you're really saying, this is a business issue. This solving this does not, you know, isn't going to make or break my career, make or break my identity, but it's going to help the business it's much easier to be practical and make rational decisions because we don't get into that stress response, what Dan Goleman, who wrote Emotional Intelligence, calls amygdala hijack, where we don't make rational decisions. Um, it's easier if we can just say, this is about the business. And I even have coaching clients who will tell themselves, you know, give themselves a mantra when they get, especially an avoider, when they get into a conflict, they'll tell themselves a mantra, this is about the business. This isn't about me, right? It just helps to sort of remove it, remove the, the ego from it. Um, the second reason to depersonalize is that if you start to personalize and you get that attachment that I'm talking about, the other person's gonna pick up on that and they're gonna think, oh wait, this is about our egos? Well, then I'm gonna, right? And they start to sort of dig in further as well. And if you can keep it focused on the, on the business level, you're more likely to, to engage your counterpart in a more rational, um, less heated discussion about, about the issues. It's, it's kind of the extension of we're really good at giving other people advice, but not so good at taking our own advice because when we wrap our own identity up in things, it can be very hard to think rationally about things. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, sometimes it's just about even self soothing that ego response that many of us have of mm -hmm. feeling like this is about me. This is about um, you know, my job, my career, this is a, they're making a judgment on how well I do my job. Um, and just sort of putting that aside, like just telling yourself, I'm good at my job, my job, this, this is, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Let me have this discussion, assuming that we're both adults, we're both good at what we do. Um, and, and we just need to solve this business issue. Uh, I'm going to move to the next question before I do. Sure. Um, for anyone, anyone, listening and watching, if you have a specific scenario in your head as, as Amy speaks, uh, something you're dealing with now or have dealt with before and could use uh, some professional guidance on, please drop in the chat. Uh, we're happy to do a little lightning round um, later. So as you see these types of conflicts, did you get any flashbacks to anything that's happened? You know, let us know. Um, speaking of personalizing conflicts, um, it's another question we got, which is the balance between uh, being a jerk and being a pushover. I find that you know myself and other people. When you come to address conflict, you go, nah, I don't want to be. I don't want to be a jerk about it. Like I'll just let it go. Or the flip, you know, I don't want to be a pushover. I need to fight everybody all the time. Um, yeah. Delicate balance. How do I? How do we navigate this? Yeah, I'm a big advocate of approaching conflict with compassion and kindness. Um, that I think it, instead of thinking about, am I going to get my way? I think we really focusing on the process. How do we? How can we get through this conflict together, right? So rather than thinking of the other person as the adversary or mm -hmm. even your counterpart, I know I used that, that language earlier, but thinking of them as your partner and trying to solve the issue, right? So if you think about there's you and there's me, I often like to say there's like a third entity, which is the problem. Mm -hmm. And you all are on the same side of the table trying to solve that problem. So if you can, if you can think of yourselves as um, partners in doing that, 
you're going to have a, you're going to approach it with much more compassion and kindness in doing that. Now, in no way does that mean that you are a pushover. Aligning yourself with the other person doesn't mean you're going to roll over and give in to all of their demands. But if you can think about how do we do this together, you sort of don't have to worry about being a jerk or being a pushover. You have to think about how do we both get our interests and needs met without, um, you know, without harming each other in, in, in any way. Um, you know, the other thing I would think about is how, what's your natural tendency? If you tend to be a seeker, sure, you might come off as a jerk in the conversation. So think about how can I, how can I sort of rein that in a little bit? Because that's going to put the other person on the defensive. Um, there's another chart in the book um, of when you're a seeker and when you're an avoider and when you're dealing with a seeker who, or an avoider. I think it's like page 45 or something. Mm -hmm. um, I'll find the exact page number if people are interested. Um, but, you know, that's, this is sort of aligns with this jerk or pushover, you know, um, framework as well. So if you're a seeker and you come in, usually guns a blazing, be careful about that, right? How can you give room for the other person to make sure you're hearing their interests and their needs? Because the goal isn't to just bulldoze. The goal is to come up with a solution that everyone can live with. Likewise, I have a lot of avoiders who say, well, if I were to push harder on this, if I were to make my needs explicit or to demand something, I'm, I fear I'd come off as a jerk. It's rare that avoiders come off as, as jerks, to be quite honest, because their, their natural tendency is not to do that. So you, you can lean in a little bit, mm -hmm. think about your seeker colleague, how would they express their needs in this conflict? How would they push for what they need and adapt a little bit of that, that style? Chances are you are not going to come off as a jerk. And, for, and first and foremost, like I said at the beginning, really think about kindness and compassion, not just toward the other people involved in the conflict, but toward yourself during the conversation. The more, again, you can soothe that ego, stay in your rational mind, rash, you know, access that prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for rational thinking, the better the conversation is going to go and the more likely you and the other person will get what they need. I think it's a great segue. So it's easy not easy. I think it's easier to have a conflict with someone you have a somewhat of a relationship with. You've worked together for months or months or years. Um, a lot of people work in partnerships or working with their counterparts in other companies for the first time. Don't have context for all their internal issues or problems, uh, even that person's career, what that person's going through. Um, so managing that in this in this framework that a lot of partnerships uh, are, are set out to be 50-50 split or some agreed set of responsibilities. And then the other, the other person doesn't live up to their standards. How do, we, how do we approach this for someone external where we don't have that history with? Yeah, so a few things. One, first and foremost, I think anytime you enter a difficult conversation where you feel like you're gonna have to communicate a tough message, it's important to think about what is your goal? What is it you actually want? Is it that you want that person to live up to what they've, they've um, said they're going to do? Um, is it that you want them to know that you're dissatisfied? Like, what is it you're actually trying to achieve in the conversation? Because I think oftentimes we don't think that through clearly. Yeah, we just like word vomit out our extra, Exactly, yeah. yeah. When we get like halfway through a conversation and when then we realize, oh, actually what I really want is this. So that, mm -hmm. and that goal, if you can think about that ahead of time, should guide how you approach the conversation and should guide what you say. Right, so really keeping that primary in your mind. And then you might have multiple goals, um, but what's your primary one? And you get bonus points if you can think of a goal, if you can focus on a goal that the other person shares. When you say it's easier internally, partly it's easier internally because we have shared goals. We want what's best for the business. We want mm -hmm. what's best for our team. Um, with someone else, you might have conflicting goals, and but ultimately, you probably have a shared goal. That's why you entered into the partnership in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's really helpful to appeal to that. Here are the goals we agreed on early on. I know we both care about this, right? Again, anything you can do to make sure that it feels as if, and it's true, that you and the other person are on the same team trying to reach the same outcome. Now, that doesn't mean it's all going to be, you know, puppies and rainbows, right? You're going to hit some some roadblocks for sure. And you may have to deliver tough messages to say, you know, we agreed to X, Y, and Z. I don't see you doing Y. Help, help me figure out why that is. What can I do to support you to make that happen, 
right? Mm -hmm. Again, this is a collaborative conversation. You're going to end up with a much better outcome if you don't think about how do I take that person to task? How do I force them to do what they want to do, what they, what they don't want to do rather? How do I, it, it, all of that sort of approach doesn't really work. Doesn't mean you can't be tough and have high expectations, mm -hmm. but you should do that in a partnership mentality, collaborative mentality. Uh, we, we were getting some questions and please keep asking questions after the fourth question I asked Amy, we'll address some of these. Um, but I was thinking while you, you were talking, Rosa, a lot of these frameworks are very like top down or in a vacuum. And I think you have a lot of in the trenches training, whether it's our experience, whether it's yourself or your coaching. Um, what are some of the common resistance points to this, this message of, of empathy? Because easier said than done, right? Yeah, that's, that's a big one, right? Easier said than done when I'm in, when I'm actually in the conversation, that person's not being, you know, they're not collaborating, they're resisting, they're, right, right, right. that, that is definitely one of the, yeah, what happens if they're a jerk, right, essentially is what, yeah, yeah, and, and, <laughs> I, and unfortunately, I have somewhat of a dissat, unsatisfying answer to that, because, you know, ultimately, you cannot control another person, and, and you may, you know, want to pull out all the stops, threaten to pull it out of the partnership, all of that, it's not, it's not going to be helpful if you're, if you're not, approaching it in a, in a collaborative way. The best way to get someone to sort of step up and be and approach it in the way you want to is to model that behavior, even if they act like a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. And that, again, that's not to say when someone comes out with, well, you're, you're, you know, you're, you, you haven't held up your end of the bargain either, mm -hmm. that you shouldn't dis disagree with that or point out the ways that you have. It just means that you're Every time you're, you're, that person is trying to sort of put you on opposite sides of the table, you're trying to put yourselves on the same side of the table. The other pushback I get a lot is people say, you know, that's not what my bosses want me to do, right? Mm -hmm. Or I, my manager wants me to go in. And, and really what I, what I often encourage people to do is, is educate your manager on what will that do long term for the partnership or for the relationship with the other person? You don't want them to show up and do their part because you've shamed them or embarrassed or threatened them, right? That's not laying the groundwork. And negotiation experts will tell you, you don't want to get to a place where you're delivering ultimatums. You mm -hmm. may educate them about what your alternatives are. And one of your alternatives may end the partnership or to find a different vendor or find a different partner. That certainly may be some of your alternatives, but you don't want to get to a point where you're using ultimatums because that's not going to lay the groundwork for strong relationships going forward. Can you think of a, uh, you know, a clever, interesting way that someone has overcome that kind of stubbornness on the other side? Say again, how would they, what can thing? you think of a, a clever or memorable way in which someone has overcome that stubbornness on the other side? Overcome. Yeah. yeah. So actually I just, I just edited an article for Harvard Business Review from some researchers who researched the, um, the ultimatum point in a negotiation and the interesting, um, the interesting finding they had is they, their theory going into the research was that people with a choice mindset, meaning that you were someone who thought about multiple choices you had and mm -hmm. multiple choices that your counterpart had were much more likely not to give into those ultimatums, right? So going into the, the negotiation, if you did an exercise where you wrote down, here are all the choices I have. I can leave the partnership. I can change the agreement. I can um, put it on pause, whatever, whatever your options are. Then also write down what all their options are when you actually get to the point where the other person lays out an ultimatum, you're much less likely to give in and you're more mm -hmm. likely to say, which I think is a good tactic, say, you know what, I think we have more options than what you're laying out there, mm -hmm. right? I appreciate that, that it feel, we feel stuck, but I think if we put our heads together, we can come up with some better options than, than what we've just, you know, the conclusion we've just reached. Um, you don't have to feel like your back's against the wall if you thought about it beforehand, right? Exactly. Exactly. And you've also, I think the ultimatum is saying we don't have choices. And if you believe actually we do have choices, we do have options, not just me, but you too, we all have options. You're going to be approaching it again in a, in a less um, sort of worked up manner. It's going to be less, less, feel less threatening 
if you if you've primed yourself to know there are other options out there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take us to our, our last question. So there's um, we're not we're not having this discussion in a vacuum, right? There are, there are things happening in the world. There's an ongoing pandemic, a national conversation around systemic racism. Um, lots of people are dealing with both changes to their home lives and work lives that are unprecedented. Um, is there a better way to approach conflict, a more humane way to approach conflict as all this is going on and, and all of us are affected? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I've been talking about so far is, is that sort of more humane, compassionate way, um, really thinking about you and the other person as on the same team, trying to solve a, a shared goal, even if you have goals that are different, ultimately you probably have something you both want and focusing on that. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind, everything happening in the world right now makes us all, um, it, it sort of gives us very few cognitive resources or extra cognitive resources, right? We're dealing with stress. You're not kidding. Um, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? I mean, I, 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 my husband asked me last night what we had, what, what I, we should do for dinner and I almost burst into tears, right? Like just the idea that I had to make yet another decision and I'm in a very fortunate position um, right now in terms of work and, and privilege and all of that. So even I'm feeling the stress of, of having to use my brain to make very simple decisions. And you have to keep in mind that everyone you interact with is going through their own um, situation, right? They, everyone has their own struggle. And I think the most important thing, particularly at this moment, is to remind yourself you don't know what someone else is up against. So mm -hmm. they may show up as a little, little, you know, square on your, on your um, computer, but they've got a whole history, um, a whole day's worth, months worth, years worth of struggles that they have probably faced that have, that are contributing to how they're showing up. So when someone is short with you or rude, or um, you feel like they're not doing what they said they were going to do, you know, tell instead of, forming a story about that, which is what we often, we're naturally meaning makers as humans, right? So mm -hmm. we often will tell ourselves a story. So if you showed up, Sean, totally frowning, um, you know, distracted, checking your phone while we're on this, on this, you know, happy hour, I would probably make up a story that you weren't interested in what I had to say, mm -hmm. right? But maybe you're checking your phone because you have a, a family member who's sick or, you know, maybe you just got a, a text from your boss that there are going to be layoffs at your organization, right? We just have to ha keep in mind that people have so much going on that we don't see and to approach everyone with the compassion we would with someone who we know very well, our best friend, a family member, um, and to ask people, how are you doing? I mean, I think, especially with partnerships, it, we're, you know, you're not seeing their day to day. You're not, you don't know what's happening at their organization or what's happening on their team. So to always start the conversation with how are you doing? And, and not even, I think, how are you doing often warrants the fine, right? Like, <laughs> how are you, right? Like the very knee jerk response, but asking a more involved question, like, are you doing okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, is your family safe and healthy right now? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and those don't have to be deeply personal questions but they give someone an opportunity to tell you where they're at so that you're more generous in their, in your interpretation um, of their, um, of their situation. You know, it, you, Sean, you mentioned before we started that you had recently watched my TEDx talk and there's a story I tell in that, that TEDx talk of being on the highway with my daughter driving mm -hmm. along and these two motorcyclists come whizzing by probably going like hundred miles an hour and I'm thinking this was like a teachable moment for my daughter in case she ever gets on a motorcycle, you know, pointed out that they weren't wearing helmets. And I said, oh, that's so dangerous. You know, I really laid into them about how dangerous that was and they shouldn't be doing that. And what if I hit them and, and they died and then I'd be responsible, like the whole thing. Right. And then she said she was quiet. She listened, listened, took it in. And then a few minutes later said, mommy, maybe they're on their way to buy helmets, which clearly was not what they were doing, right? Um, maybe. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it was. And, but the point is like, can you be as generous as possible in your interpretation? When someone's checking their phone, you know, while you're in the middle of talking to them, instead of thinking, wow, they're distracted because they're not interested. Like, can you think, wow, I hope they're okay, right? Mm -hmm. I, I hope everything's okay. And even asking, 
you know, I noticed you checking your phone. Is everything all right? Right. Like in a really genuine concerned way, not an accusation. I, I just think there's ways in which we can be more humane, more compassionate right now that involve very little effort on our, on our behalf. And, and folks that work in partnerships tell me that to be good at the job, you need to be curious. And they usually mean that in a, in a business sense, like be curious about the other company and their business model, the thing they care about. But I think a good reminder is to be curious about the individual you're working with um, and, and be respectful about what they're going through or what they could be going through. Yeah. There's an author named Caroline Webb who writes for um, Harvard Business Review occasionally. And she talks about um, telling yourself stories, but telling yourself, because we do interpret behavior in certain ways. So when you do that, like this person is being a complete jerk, tell yourself, well, what else, what other stories could I tell about mm -hmm, this? Mm -hmm. What else, what are other alternatives to the, to the narrative I've created? And that's not, you know, you're not trying to get it right. You're just trying to open up your mind so that you're not wedded to your interpretation because then confirmation bias comes into play where we you always say, find evidence that that's true. Yeah, exactly. I see they're a jerk, right? Like he just rolled his eyes at me when, when, who knows why you're rolling your eyes, right? It's just, it, it, we have to sort of avoid those knee jerk um, interpretations of, of behavior right now. That, that brings to our, our, our Q and A. Uh, I want to read one of the questions we got via the sure. chat, um, which is, uh, I find other parties often don't have the same level as empathy to me to hear my needs or to pull me into relevant topics. What is the right way to have the other party seek me out and consider my needs? Yes, oh, such a good question because this is, and this is earlier when you were talking about, you know, easier, easier than it's easier said than done, mm -hmm. right? This is one of the things is it is incredibly hard to continuously display empathy mm -hmm. for someone who is not displaying it for you, right? And, and it really feels very one-sided when someone's not seeing things from your perspective. Now, I'm, one of the things I tell, particularly my coaching clients, but also my 13-year-old daughter, is that empathy is not something you expect from other people. It's something you, you earn from other people or you model. Um, and you can't, you can't force them to, to do what you want them to do. That said, there's some interesting research about how to encourage others to have empathy for you. Um, in particular, uh, there's some really interesting research from Columbia University of asking a question that encourages the person to see things from your perspective. So in the middle of a discussion about how are we gonna handle this disagreement? How are we gonna resolve this issue that's come up? You might ask a question like, what would you do if you were in my shoes, mm. right? Because that for a moment makes them think, I mean, and they might say, I just give in to all my demands, right? <laughs> like, but rarely that happens. What happens is they, for a, for a minute, they have to think about what, what is your perspective, right? Um, and instead of saying, please see it from my perspective, which someone will immediately say, of course, I'm seeing it from your perspective, you ask them for advice, right? What would you do if you were in my shoes? Or, you know, I hear you, but I'm going to have to explain this to my boss. Help me think about how I would explain it to my boss, right? Just anything that can encourage them to see it, to put themselves in your shoes just for a moment um, can encourage that, that empathy. Um, you know, the other thing I think is really helpful, especially when you're dealing with someone who might be stubborn or unempathetic, and this is a trick from, from negotiation experts, is to, is the, when someone's really stuck in their perspective, seems unwilling to change their mind, the, one of the best ways to encourage them to change their mind is to show that you're willing to change yours. So mm -hmm. pick a very low stakes, um, decision you've made or perspective you've put out there and say, you know what, based on this conversation, I actually feel differently about what I said at the beginning. I actually feel like that. And it, it don't reverse something that's really important, but demonstrate that, that you were open to, to hearing what they had to say, the information they shared, the assumptions they shared caused you to change your mind hmm. because that demonstrates this is what this conversation is about. And it actually depolarizes. So hmm. Oftentimes we get really stuck when we are like, if this is A, no, this is B, no, this is A, right? If you can say, okay, I actually, I believed A, but now I believe C a little bit too, right? That encourages them to start, start, start adapting their perspective as well. Doesn't always work, but it's, it's one way, um, particularly in negotiation theory that we find um, works to sort of loosen people's um, stuckness. It's like an odd kind of like the prisoner's dilemma, right? Like I need 
you need to come through a little bit and show some good faith and then I'll come through a little bit and we'll like, we'll eventually hopefully start to tack in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. The other th piece of advice I give to people when you have an ongoing conflict with someone who's just a jerk and you just like, you don't have power to change it. You can't, I mean, and maybe you, you're able to sort of push the business along or push, push the partnership along, but um, you know, that person is just so unpleasant to interact with them. What I often tell myself, tell people and tell myself is like their punishment is having to wake up as that unpleasant person every day. Yeah. And you get to wake up as an empathetic, compassionate, kind person. And that's your reward. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's, I mean, it's sometimes it helps because it does, you know, you, you sometimes we're dealing with jerks, you know, and, and there's no way to quote unquote punish them or hold them accountable because of the dynamics and the relationship. So you just have to remind yourself, it's sad for them to have to be that person. Mm -hmm. uh, the last question we have is, especially as many of us in knowledge working or white collar jobs have gone remote, um, how do I understand the tone in asynchronous communication, whether that's Slack or email or chat? Uh, is, is someone being curt because they're a brusque person or are they just upset or is everything well? Um, you know, as we all become, as you said, like little boxes on a screen um, and shout out to everyone watching us while they're cooking dinner right now or whatever. Um, right. <laughs> yep. how, how, how do you, how do you, you know, help address conflict when you don't even know the context of which the person's coming from? Yeah. So, unfortunately, the forms of communication that we have available to us now, Slack, email, text, even, even video chat, are not as high fidelity as we need to resolve conflicts because we need to be able to pick up on someone's body language. There's like all these, this energy we pick up, like interesting research when you walk into a room and there's been a heated discussion going on, you know right away before you hear right. anything said or even look at anyone in the eye, you just sort of get the sense, right? We're not getting the sense and that's really hard. Um, that requires two things I'd recommend. One is try to increase the fidelity, right? This is better, video conference is better than Slack where you really cannot read tone, where it's sort of ripe for miscommunication. So if things are gonna be tense, try, video conference or phone, you actually hear a lot on, um, you know, in someone's tone of voice. Um, so that's one thing, try to incre increase the fidelity of the communication. Um, two, also, uh, you know, come, I come back to assume positive intent, right? So if someone says something that's really curt, don't assume it's because mm -hmm. they're uninterested or disregarding your perspective or mad at you you know, assume they're rushed, right? I, I have a colleague who sends me one word emails all the time and it's not my style. And sometimes I'm like, can't you just be a little kind, right? But I have to remind myself like- Oh, and a smiley. <laughs> exactly, just give me an emoji, something, right? But no, like I have to remind myself, she is incredibly busy. She's under a lot of pressure and that's just her, the way she communicates. It's not, there's no harm intended. And actually I'm gonna throw in a, th a third piece of advice, which is to, um, is to really over communicate. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you do want to address the, the behavior, it's really helpful to say, I know it wasn't your intention, but I, I interpreted that last email as, as, feeling, as you not feeling good about what's happening here or as you being angry. I know that wasn't your intention, but can we talk about what's going on, mm. right? And I think if you say, I know that wasn't your intention, right. it, it separates that person from their impact, from their from their intention because they maybe they made you mad maybe they they upset you but that it to tell them that that was their intent we know this right when someone says you did this right we feel so defensive so it, it disarms some of that defensiveness so they can tell you actually know what my intention was was this right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some good questions coming in keep asking we'll keep uh okay. we'll keep answering them sure um Great one here. Uh, what's your advice for working with a colleague that just provides a stream of consciousness of complaints when you're trying to help them? When they're stressed, for example, they use this tactic to deflect from having to do the work. So just a uh, chronic chronic complainer as you're trying to mitigate. Yeah, that is one of my least favorite people, types of people to work with, to be quite honest, because um, it, it, just that sort of negativity, like that constant negativity, especially when you're in a, in a high stakes or stressful interaction with them, it's mm -hmm. just, it just spirals things, right? You just, and you start to feel like, ugh, like everything's horrible. And then you, you have that confirmation bias kick in of like, this person's unpleasant. I don't like working with them. Oh God, they're just like complaining, complaining. 
Um, I think one of the best things you can do, and this actually, I believe this made it into my book. Um, this is advice from Jean Brett, who runs the um, Dispute Resolution Center at, at Kellogg. Um, mm -hmm. She talks about watching that person talk and just imagining the words coming out of their mouth and going over your shoulder, right? So you sort of let, because if you hook into any of those complaints, they're going to just go deeper and deeper. So just sort of let, okay, like, yep, I'm letting that go over my shoulder and then respond with something constructive. So mm -hmm. not, oh, well, I can fix that complaint or, oh yeah, just say, I hear you. What do you want to do next? Mm -hmm. Right. And engage them in a conversation that, that requires them to look forward instead of complaining about the past or complaining about the present and gives them some agency. A lot of times people complain because they don't feel like they have power or agency to make decisions. So mm -hmm. what do you think we should do next? Right. I hear you on all of that. What should we do next? And I, and I think you don't saying I hear you doesn't mean you agree. Doesn't mean that you endorse all of her, those complaints. Um, but it, it gives them, sort of doesn't put them on the defensive, but lets them sort of put that aside and then focus forward. What do you think, Sean? You think that would help? Yeah, I was, I was thinking a lot about agency where I feel like that characteristic of someone is more common, although not exclusive to larger organizations or more complex organizations because they feel like they don't have the agency and that is, that is their outlet. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I've worked for both big companies and, and startups and you know, the level of conflict is different for a five person for just trying to keep the lights on versus 10,000 people where this monolith. And yeah. I think the complainer is more common to the, to the latter. And I never thought about agency, giving and granting agency as a way of mitigating conflict, but it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, and again, the other thing is I can imagine with partnerships, although I don't, don't work on them, I can imagine there's oftentimes there's you and the other person you have to deal with from the other company but then you have a whole host of decision makers and stakeholders that you have to then go back and negotiate with, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you feel that pressure of what your manager wants or your team wants or what your senior leadership wants at your team. And it's sometimes helpful to just sort of be, be candid about that and say, I get that this is the pressure I'm under. Help me figure out how to negotiate internally here, right? How, how, if, if I went back with what we're agreeing on, I know I'd get pushback. So can you help me figure that out? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people in partnerships tell me, you know, I'm negotiating with them, I'm negotiating with my team, and then I know they're negotiating with their team, and sometimes I have to go and negotiate with their team, and I have three, like, uh, counterparts. Yes, um, yeah. Well, well, I think I can speak for everyone in the, in the chat and the, and the attendees. Amy, thank you for joining us. Uh, if people want to work with you further, even mm -hmm. hire you, buy your book, where can they find you, where can they learn more about? Um, best place is my website, amyegallo.com. Um, you can also find all my writing on Harvard at hbr.org. Um, there's, there's a, you know, if you link through from my bio at HBR, you'll find my website there. there. Yep. Um, and then it's, yeah, www.amyegallo.com. Um, cool. Uh, and if you want to keep up on other happy hours, uh, like this one, uh, we'll probably have one next month and this is our fourth. We'll hope to have uh, many more, um, crossbeam.com slash subscribe, uh, or just Google crossbeam newsletter and sign up. And, uh, we send it every Tuesday and that's where we give the heads up. These things are happening. Um, Amy, thank you so much for your time and everyone that's, uh, watching. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your questions. Thanks so much.